seated. Then we'll turn to Revelation chapter 3. We'll read again verses 18 through 22. Revelation 3, verses 18 through 22. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man on my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, we talked last time about the Feast of Tabernacles, the Lord coming in and supping with us, and uh, we with him. Now, the next verse says, To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, which, of course, is talking about the kingdom of God. Now, what is the relationship between the Feast of Tabernacles and the Kingdom of God? Why is it that God is restoring both of these concepts at the same time? Do you know? Because one is dependent on the other. In what way? Pardon? I haven't been in school in a long time. You're in school every time you come to church, Kathy. <laughs> okay. I thought Bill would be on that like a hen on corn. The relationship between these two concepts, the Feast of Tabernacles and the Kingdom. People on the tape will be checking out their tape recorder to see if it's broken. <laughs> Long pauses. Give up. The kingdom has to be established in each individual before it can be established in the earth. Okay, you're close. You're close. You're right on the trail. Phil? The same. In what way? And that if you, if the Feast of Tabernacles is the kingdom, and when you are filled with the Father and the Son, Okay, can you take it one step further? And then you are able to go forth and release the material creation. Okay, there's a key here, and by the way, we're not picking this up, which is maddening on tape. Uh, several things have been said. The idea is that the, they're the same. One is dependent on the other, and it has to do the, with the fact that the Father and the Son are within us, and then we go forth to deliver. Now, there's one... Yeah, you can summarize that very simply. God rules in the kingdom, right? In what way does he rule? He rules through Jesus. And so the throne of Christ and the throne of God, in that sense, are one because the, the rule is coming through Jesus. He said, the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. So the thrones there have become one. Uh, God stays in the background, and Jesus gives, administrates. God speaks, and Jesus administrates, or actually 
rules. Is that true? Jesus is the ruler. You remember Psalms 2? He said uh, uh, that we would rule, that Jesus would rule. Ask of me and I'll give you the, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Kiss the son lest he be angry. And it's written that Jesus shall rule. Uh, and he has a scepter and he will rule because it is God in Jesus. Is that right? Now let me ask you something. Does God tabernacle in Jesus? Is there any scripture that says that God dwells in Jesus? Several. Where? Do you know where it says that? There's one book that says this several times. I can do nothing but the Father who dwells in me. Where is that? Judy has it. Judy Klein has it. Where is it, Judy? It's in the Gospel of John. Several times, Jesus said, I can do nothing. But the Father who dwells in me. And that verb is the same word that we translate mansion. Same word, the Father who mansions in me or who dwells in me. He does the works. Now, Jesus, the main thing about Jesus that we must understand, it's so hard for us because of our traditions, but what is the most significant thing about Jesus coming? How is he coming? How is he coming? In what function or what office? As a ruler and as a judge, exactly. It's so hard for us because of our centuries of tradition, we picture that, that where all this is going is to paradise. Where all this is going is to a kingdom. And Jesus, what's his name? His office. King of kings and Lord of lords. So the whole thing, where, where all this is going, all of our struggle and all of Christianity and all the travail is not heading toward paradise. Paradise will be a product. But the, the cent center of the gospel is this idea of a throne, of ruling and judging. Now, that's something that we're making the transition about. We don't understand it clearly because it conflicts with what we picture. Oh, if I could die and go to heaven. Well, we all feel like that, I'm sure. Huh? You feel like that? If we could just die and go to heaven and get out of here and have peace and rest and perfect health and fly around without gravity and so on, it would be so wonderful. It would be novel. If nothing else, it would be a change. And... Uh, but the idea that this has something to do with, with government is still on the periphery out here somewhere. We're occupied with the things that have come up, like getting clothing to people and ministering to them, getting them out of jail and, and uh, helping them in every way, which is as it should be. That's what it's supposed to be. But it's the case where you get so busy... Uh, you get so busy with the alligators, you forget that what you're supposed to do is drain the swamp. And that can't be helped. I mean, this is life. But every once in a while, God has to put in our spirits where this is going. And what, it, what it's all going to is a kingdom. Uh, that is rule. Rule not only over the earth, but over the heavens as well. Because you remember when the battle takes place in Revelation 12... The battle is where first? In the heavens. See, Michael and his angels fought. See, it's all war. What the Bible is about is war. And why war? Why is it about war? Why, you know, we don't, you, there isn't one American in 350. If you ask them what the Bible is about, they would say war. They might say peace. They probably say being good, but if you said to them, what the Bible is about is war, they'd think you're some kind of a fanatic. But it is primarily about war. War in the spirit realm, war on earth, war in Canaan, 
Armageddon, thrones, wars, judgment. Why? Why isn't it about going up where we can all love one another and the children can play on the serpent's nest and not be hurt? Why is it primarily about war? Earl? Yeah, rebellion. Yes, and who's rebelling? It started with Satan, and Satan was not a demon. Now, where the demons came from, I do not know. The Bible does not say where the demons came from. They appear in the four Gospels. But I don't know as they're mentioned. In, in the Old Testament, we have an evil spirit trouble Paul, uh, Saul, but there's no accent whatsoever on demons. I think you could, I haven't checked this out, but I think you could read through all the major prophets and not even find the word demon. I don't know as the word demon appears in the whole Old Testament. But when you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's demons, 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 demons. So I cannot tell you where they came from. I can tell you that they appear in the Gospels and in Acts. And it's the first sign that you'll follow the believers. We shall cast them out, but they don't appear in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not about demons. So where they came from, I do not know. But Paul told us, he never said we were wrestling against demons. Paul said we were wrestling against archons in the Greek, which means leaders, rulers in the heavenlies. Now, the demons are on earth, apparently, and I don't know where they came from. But why are we wrestling, and that's war, against these archons? Why? Why not leave them alone? What's the issue? And what about the earth? Exactly. Exactly. It's a matter of will. And whose wills are being are in opposition? Just two. The are the uh, cherub. Satan, and these cherubs must be vast beings, I mean, beyond what anything we can comprehend in size, in intelligence, and who else? The Father. The Father. The Father is on one hand, and Satan is on the other. And these two are in opposition God, Satan, said, I will be like the Most High. He set himself to have his will without obeying the Father, without submitting himself to the Father. Now, Jesus submitted himself to the Father because the Scripture says, speaking, the Father speaking to Jesus says, uh, thou, Jesus, have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Now, what does iniquity mean? Lawlessness. Not sin generalized, but lawlessness. That is, not obeying law. Now, whose law is at stake here? God's. Okay. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, therefore, now this is God speaking to Jesus, therefore, God has exalted you above your fellows. Now, the implication seems to be here that Satan was and is seeking that which God has given to Jesus. Now, all of our Christianity, in all of the material realm, everything that we see around us, whether it's Super Bowl or World War III or whatever it is, is all only happening 
because of this one simple fact that the Father has a will, Jesus has submitted to it, and Satan has a will which is contrary. Satan would not choose Jesus. He would not do that. That's what everything is about. Everything is about. And all other things, whether we're clothing the poor or what we may be doing, are necessary. They are, ne they are absolutely necessary, but they are not central. What is central is this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That is what is central. Now, if you have two classes of beings, one with one will and another with another will, what are you going to have? War. As Bill said, someone is going to have his will done. There's nothing in the middle. There's not a third will. These powers are so great that all other wills are inconsequential. They mean nothing. Our will, your will, my will. If we do not choose God's will, we automatically come under Satan's will. We are only mud pots. We do not have any kind of strength. We are just random molecules floating around compared with these forces. Now, you may not believe that, but if you don't, maybe either God or Satan will show you sometime that you really do not have the power, except through the name of Jesus, to do anything much at all. I mean, you'll be fortunate when you wake up some morning if you can get out of bed. Very fortunate. And you realize that we really do not have any strength or wisdom. And so, so this war is being fought. It has not been resolved. It is still going on. Now, in the center of this thing is God's throne. Satan aspires to this. I will sit in the sides of the north. All right, in the center of this is God's throne. Now, God, in his infinite wisdom, has put his throne in Jesus now, it didn't just happen that way. If you'll notice the scripture, to him that overcometh, even as I overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Jesus wasn't just naturally, normally given this throne. He had to do what? He had to overcome. What was at issue here in Christ's life? Not my will. And Christ spoke this out of an agony. We can say that we love God and we want to hate lawlessness and we should say it. But God has ways of finding out how deep that goes. As he found out with Abraham. As he found out with Abraham. I mean, you can say, uh, I'll do your will. I delight to do thy will, yea, thy laws within my heart, O God. Until you're in Gethsemane. Now, er, now Jesus had everything rolled out in Gethsemane. I mean, he had everything rolled out. His fellowship with God, the most important. His inheritance of people. The joy and the glory of the world that he had come from and the joy that was held out to him in the future. Everything was on one turn of pitch and toss. Everything was rolled up, and God, in his infinite wisdom, has ways of taking everything that mean anything to you and putting it in one box and saying, give it to me. He has ways of doing that. 
And you don't get that when you've been a Christian for two and a half years. But you'll get something. But you won't get that one. But as you go further with God, these things become more intense. And we refer to it as a cross. But they, they become more intense and then we begin to question and we say, well, you know, why do I have to be treated like this? Well, you know, why can't I have what I want? And in order to answer that, it's, that's why it's so important to understand what's going on. Because when God is requiring everything of you, it is important to understand this is not a random thing in which God is trying to amuse himself with your pain or some... Uh, the devil got in or something else. That isn't what is causing the denial of what you want. It is God who is preparing you to side with him against the adversary. Adversaries. The adversary and his helpers. War. And that's why everything hinges on Overcoming. And what you overcome are the things that are pushing against you to keep you from doing what? God's will. God's will. See, that's, it's as simple as that. Now, it may be masked. It may not be clear to you, and you may doubt. And that's fine. That's part of the game. It's to make you pray. Is this really a test from the Lord? Is this my foolishness? Is this something that I'm supposed to bull through? What is going on here? And that's proper that you and I should walk in darkness and uh, for seasons and not understand. That's part of the thing, is to trust God when you don't understand what is happening. And then you have to stand on the Word. And the Word says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, we don't see him, we don't feel him, but we have to believe when we do not understand what is going on that Jesus has not left us. Why hast thou forsaken me, O God? That Jesus has not left us. Now, this, this you can call it a cross, you can call it an overcoming struggle, you can call it against will, you can call it what you want to, but this increases throughout your Christian life. And the reason it increases is because the further you can go with this thing, or not as though we're, we're uh, asked to be presumptuous and dare God to see how far he can take us. That isn't the attitude. We're only happy when we're content with the level where we are. There's no use seeking beyond your level. If God, if we've got the old thing that's driving us on to want to rule and to be something, God has ways of changing our mind on that thing. Some things aren't just worth it. It isn't worth it to rule or anything else. You may not appreciate that yet. Maybe someday you'll appreciate that more. But what is going on here is not just because you're getting older that things get rougher. It's because God is probing deeper and deeper to see how far he can take you into obedience. Because this is what is at issue. Nothing else. Not faith in the sense we use it. It is a form of faith. Not knowledge, not anything. The thing that God values is obedience. Satan was brilliant. God isn't looking for brilliant people. He's looking for obedient people. And this, brother and sister, is where Christ was tested. And he learned it. How? by the things which he suffered. Now, how, do, how does that go together? It's as God puts you into places, we always have a choice. We always have a choice. At any given time, you can opt out. Now, you, now I can't say that's always true because sometimes in physical affliction, you can't. Or if you're incarcerated and under handcuffs, you can't. But in many cases, 
we, and maybe in sometimes in those cases you can too, we can opt out of the severity and the intensity of this, uh, this struggle. We can opt out of it. And so that is why obedience and suffering go hand in hand, is because we can choose not to. We can choose to save our life. And when we choose to do the will of God rather than save our life, and there's a lot of little ways in which we, this is manifested. For example, when we forgive people, instead of saving our life in our right to be mad and to be bitter, and we give over and say, okay, Lord, I surrender that. I give you that. You said vengeance is mine, so I give you that. I will obey you in this. It manifests itself in little things. When you know the Lord's will about something, a young person is deciding a career, deciding marriage or something, and they get all in a flame. And when you defer to the Lord and say, not my will, Lord, but yours, be done, it manifests itself in little practical ways. When you're tempted to fly off the handle and exercise your ability to give people a piece of your mind or a piece of your tongue, and you say, no, Lord, I'll give that over to you. I, I, I sure could do it, and I feel like doing it, but I know it's not pleasing to you. These little things like this, this is where it's manifest. And when you give this over to the Lord in obedience, see that it becomes second nature, and then it comes deeper testings, and then deeper testings. And why? Because the Father has called us to rule. And I say, that does not sound very attractive. I cannot, under, I cannot really tell you why this is so important. All I know is, this is what the Bible is about. Now, when we were in, in worldly Christianity or in nominal Christianity, we were taught that we were kings and priests. And all nominal Christians believe this. This is in the hymnology. It's all, all over the place. Even people talk about the rapture, believe that they're to be kings and priests and all this but if you stop to think of it, it's not real. They have no intention. What would they do if they were given? They say, oh, we're going to rule over cities. What would they do if they were placed in a city and told to rule? They can't even rule the simplest thing. I mean, they can't even get along with people. They couldn't rule over the cat. Well, they can't. They can't rule over their dog. The dog runs the house, and they're, they're part of the dog's pack, and they don't even realize it. If you're not careful, your dog will rule your pack, and that's instinctive with them, and they learn how to do it. You just become one more pup in your dog's pack. Many dogs rule the American home. Didn't you know that? You think you're ruling your dog? I told you, how many times am I going to tell you, get, Bowser, get off the couch? And you yell in vain, and Bowser looks at you. And Bowser, when Bowser gets ready to eat, Bowser lets you know. And here comes you in your livery waiting on Bowser. Did you realize that? Guess who's ruling the house? It isn't you. It's the dog. We, I mean, this is a myth. This is a mythology, kings and priests. We don't have the faintest notion we're going to die and go into the spirit realm and find we're in just another holding pattern waiting for whoever up there is going to do something to do it. Anybody that's died will tell you that. Is there anybody that's died? They'll tell you people are just all milling around with their relatives. They don't know. that. Is. Death doesn't do anything. All right, now... This is probably, this may be the greatest promise. It, it's the last promise to the overcomer, the last one. And they, they seem to ascend in power and authority. So Jesus sets a lot of emphasis on this. And he said, I did it. I'm on my father's throne because I overcame. He overcame all the way along from the wilderness temptations 
to the Garden of Gethsemane and then on the cross. He never broke discipline. Thy will be done if I'm going to lose it all. Thy will be done until he's sweating drops of blood. Not my will, but thine be done. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? You don't learn these things in the calm deliberations in an academic studio. You learn them as your soul is on fire. And you say, not my will, but thine be done. We're talking tonight about the central issue of Christianity. Salvation is a wonderful thing that God would save people and bring them into paradise. It's a wonderful thing, but it's incidental to the problem. The problem is a cherub rebelled against God, and he brought a lot of angels, a lot of spirits, and a lot of people with him, and still is today. Right in the middle of the church, people have an it. Should I obey God or not? What is it going to cost me? Should I bear my cross? Where does grace fit in and everything? Within, the, within Christians, within disciples, they're still, we, we can't get it. It's too difficult for us humans, and that's because we were born in sin and shaped in lawlessness. And the idea of just taking our life and saying, not my will, but thine be done. God, if you drag me to the dirt, I'll do it. If you take from me everything I ever wanted, I'll do it. If, I, you know, if I'm a bum all my life and nobody ever hears me, fine, I'll do it. I don't care what, your Lord, you just do it. If you put me in unpleasant circumstances, a prison all my life, fine. The only thing that matters is your will. How many Christians do you think feel that way? We struggle, don't we? What if it means this? And what, if, what if it means that? And what if I give up this? And what if I give up that? We're still part of the rebellion. We inherited that from Adam and Eve. And so God, and especially in our time, is after people who will overcome the accuser. And we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and by loving not our life to the point of death. And everything else, people, is byproducts. God's going to have some people, I don't know how many, that are going to see this thing through to the bitter end. And they are going to be first in the kingdom. Not because they want to be first in the kingdom. If, you've, if you have a desire to be first in the kingdom, you're immature. You're immature. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. If you say to a child that's three years old, you're immature. That's, that's not uh, condemnation. That's just a fact. You say, when you're mature, you'll be able to go out and get a job and support your family. But right now, you're three years old. You're not quite up to that at this point. That's, that's not an insult. That's just the truth. And if, if it really burns in you to be first in the kingdom, you're immature. God has ways of getting that out of us. He has ways. So we're not, this is not from the Lord Jesus, I don't believe, an invitation to glory. It's just a statement of fact. It isn't that we don't want to rule. It isn't that we want to rule. We simply don't know what's involved. What, is this, what will this mean to rule? Ruling people is the biggest headache in the world. You don't have a minute to yourself. Unless you've got some kind of a thing about control. But outside of that, and I guess people do, is what makes politicians, I suppose. But the average healthy human being with mental health soon learns that one thing you don't want to do is rule over other people. Unless you want to be their slave. So what is involved here, I do not know. All that I know is it will bring a blessing to other people. If we can do this thing, it will bring a blessing to other people. Now notice that Jesus, Jesus calls us into a kind of a brotherhood with himself. If you notice that here, it's a kind of a brotherhood. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne. This is the highest throne. There is no throne that is as high as this one. This is higher than all thrones other than itself. This is the supreme throne. Behind this is God Almighty. 
He has established this throne. Speaking to Jesus, the Father said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, Jesus is saying to you and to me that if we can stand this assault on our will, our God-given ability to choose, if we can sustain this assault on it and keep saying, not my will but yours be done, not my will but yours be done, not my will but yours be done. If we can stand this in spite of the world, Satan, the church, the TV, our own lust and self-will, if we can keep saying, not my will but thine be done, not my will be thine be done, something will happen. I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Now, what is important about the throne? What is important about it? It has to do with this issue of will. Otherwise, there would be no, no need for a throne. If everyone, if everyone by nature did God's will, I don't think the throne would be nearly as important except for our adoration and worship. But what is so important is because the, the commands from the throne are being uh, it rebelled against. If it weren't for that, I don't think Christianity would have the same nature that it has whatsoever. It would be an altogether different thing. If we were created in heaven and there had been no fall and we were all kind of like angels and we flew around and we were in a realm of love and our souls were pure and innocent and no sin ever entered, oh, the Bible wouldn't be the same thing at all. It's talking about thrones because of this rebellion. There's an issue of will here. Now, because I think the Lord knows that when we grow up, we no longer have a desire to govern. All we want is peace, just peace, and to enjoy the Lord's handiwork. We simply don't want to control other people. And I think God understands that, and he's speaking to mature people here. So he's not asking us whether we want this or not. But I think when we start out, we do. Now, there's an interesting parallel here between Jesus and us and Joshua and Caleb. And if you'll turn... Uh, to uh, Joshua uh, chapter 14, verses 6 through 14. And why is this associated with the Feast of Tabernacles? Why? You already said so. Why? What does this have to do with the Feast of Tabernacles? The throne is in here. In the Feast of Tabernacles, the throne of God, the rulership, is in Jesus, isn't it? See, the throne is there. That's heaven, isn't it? Heaven is my throne. And he's inviting us as we enter in, as he opens the door and knocks and sits down and sups with us and we with him, what he is setting up within us is his throne. And that's why the Feast of Tabernacles and the throne follow each other in the verses. It's not an outer throne we're dealing with. It's an inner throne. And you'll find when you get over to the New Jerusalem, and what is the New Jerusalem? The bride. And what does it say about the throne? Do you know about the New Jerusalem? The throne of God and of the Lamb are in it. Are in it. Are in the, that is in the bride. Okay, now in Joshua... 14, verse 6. Then the sons of Judah drew near to Joshua because Caleb was of Judah. There's a reason. In Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, 
You know the word which the Lord spoke to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought word back to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear, but I followed the Lord my God fully. Now, they had gone out as brethren, Joshua and Caleb, but now Joshua had been exalted, and so Caleb is coming to him, at, uh, asking him a petition. And, and now behold, verse 10, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke these 45 years from the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am 85 years old today. I am still as strong today as I was in the day Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and coming in. Now then, now then, give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard that on that day that Anakim were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out as the Lord has spoken. So Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Now, this is like Joshua is like Jesus. And he had this great inheritance. And Caleb's coming along and he said, I, this is the inheritance that I want. And so he had to overcome. Caleb had to overcome. He, he was given that, but then he had to go out and take it. And that's the same way here in uh, Revelation that Jesus is saying to us as a brother, I've got mine, and now it's your turn. And I'm extending out to you. You can come on up to where I am. You have to do what I have done. You have to conquer, and then you will have your portion in the Lord. Then there's a result of that over in uh, um, Judges 1, verse 12. Judges 1, verse 12. And Caleb said, The one who attacks Curious Sefer and captures it, I will even give him my daughter Oxa for wife, for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, so he gave him his daughter Oxa for wife. He's married his first cousin, it looks like to me. So then it came about when she came to him that she persuaded him to ask her father, she persuaded her husband to ask her father, Caleb, for a field. Then she alighted from her donkey and Caleb said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, give me a blessing. Since you have given me the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs, which to my mind speaks to me of the former and the latter rain. So what I'm saying is this, God is calling out first P Caleb's. First there's like our heavenly Joshua, our leader, who overcame. He had to overcome. Jesus had to overcome. It's hard for us to realize, isn't it? We think, well, you know, he just made it. I mean, he was born and he just went through his thing. No, he had to overcome. That thing in Gethsemane was no little thing, theological thing. That was a man in the agony, the same agony that you and I feel when we're tested, the same thing exactly. He was tempted in all points as we are. And he overcame, he overcame by saying, not my will but thine be done. He had the, the same thing, only more intense than we even have. Everything was pulled out of him. He was like a dead man and he was fighting for this thing 
that God had promised him. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for inheritance. And Jesus wanted that thing and he wanted his fellowship with God. He wanted these nations. He wanted all the glory that God had shown him. But he was put down to the place where it was a struggle. And you see, he was brought face to face with the cherub. First in the, in the garden, first in the wilderness. And Satan, even Satan, even had the gall to stand before Jesus. And what did he say? If you will worship me. And say, oh, nothing. If it wasn't nothing, it wouldn't have been done. What did Satan hold out as a reward? The kingdoms, the thing that God had promised Jesus, Satan held out to him and said, if you will just worship me, and don't worry, it was done in a way that was extremely attractive. There wouldn't appear to him a dragon with horns. I don't know how Satan appeared, but I'm telling you it was very attractive, very plausible, very much of an opportunity. And if it hadn't been a tremendous test of Christ's will, it would never have been administered. Satan doesn't waste time. And that came to him, and Jesus at that moment thought, oh, he wanted those kingdoms. He's a king. And uh, more than any of us, he wanted those people to love and bless and rule and take care of. And here it was presented to him when he was weak from fasting and tired. And, you know, come on, guy, if you'll just worship me, this is yours. This is a, it's right now. None of this cross stuff or anything else. It's yours. And Jesus put away the thing that he wanted. He put it away, turned his back on it. And he said, it is written, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You must overcome, as I also overcame. Now, when Satan comes to us, he comes in these same three areas, to test us in the realm of material security, the stone, to test us in the realm of presumption and personal ambition, the pinnacle, step out in faith. God has written, it'll come to pass. But he also tests us in the realm of our inheritance, the thing that innately is in us and that we desire more than life. And in every person in this room, there's something you desire more than life. And when God lays his finger on it, you'll understand when I talk about that a desire for power is, <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, is not up in the realms we're talking about. When he got on that thing about the kingdoms and showed Jesus the kingdoms, the thing that was in Christ, when Satan comes to you and shows you the thing that is in you, and he'll show it to you. He has a power to do it. He had the power. Imagine the power of this one cherub. He showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth in an instant of time. I mean, that's power. That's power. He's going to come to you. He's going to come to you. Sooner or later, he'll come to you. And he'll show you the thing that you want more than life. And in, it will not be manifest that it's Satan at all. It will be couched in a way that you have an extremely difficult time, an extremely difficult time discerning the origin of the voice. And to turn from that thing will mean the death of your soul. Ah! Turn, it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And it leads right straight to the cross. 
to weakness, to humility, and no inheritance at all. And you just have to look beyond by faith in God. And that's what Jesus did. And he had no more guarantee than you do. He had God's word, you have God's word. He overcame. He overcame. And therefore, he has been seated. He has everything that God promised him. He has everything that Satan promised him. But he does God's will. Now you and I are exactly in the same place. And Jesus says to us, and you see, Jesus now can come to people. I know a person who had a vision not so long ago, I guess, of people chained to a to a like a barbed wire fence. They were in their bunks, chained to their bunks, and then they were let up by their jailers and chained to their barbed wire fence. And uh, the Lord would pass by with a cup of water. And in that water was the healing of their soul. And all you had to do was drink of it. And it would heal your soul and cleanse you. But these people were like beasts. And they needed this water to become human, to become cleansed, to become right. And as the Lord would go by with this water, they would not drink. They would not drink. And you know, that's what life is like. We think down here we have it reasonably decent. Let me tell you something. Compared with life, we are just chained to barbed wire, and we don't realize it. We suffer every conceivable kind of sickness, pain, discouragement, frustration, and cling to life as though it was a marvelous thing. It's nothing but the valley of the shadow of death. It's a bondage. And the Lord comes by with a cup of water, and he holds it out to you, and he says, just drink, and you'll be healthy, you'll live. And how many people remain animals. The vision was a vision of life as it is. We just don't see it, but that's the way we're living. We're, we're chained, and we don't realize it. But we have drunk of the life, but we're chained in these bodies. Don't th doesn't it give you a problem every once in a while your body? Is there anybody in here that wants to while your body gives you a problem? <laughs> All right, now the reason that Jesus can give this cup of water is because he overcame. It made him, it put him in the position that he is able to bless people and heal them. And that's what God wants for us. If Jesus had not, if suppose, where would you and I be if when Satan had said to Jesus, if you'll worship me, Jesus had said, well, I want those kingdoms so bad, and, it, and it, after all, you know, all I can see is what's around me, and I have faith in God, but maybe there is one, maybe there isn't. I think a bird in a hand is worth two in the bush. I better say, yes. Suppose Jesus had worshipped Satan. What would have happened to our salvation? Could he have offered you a cup of cold water? No, he would have nothing to give. He would have been a dead man, just as people are who give in to Satan. They don't seem so. I'm sure he would have gotten all the kingdoms and would have burned with passion and had a marvelous time till Satan got sick of playing with him like he does with druggies, gives them a wonderful time. Then when he gets sick with playing with them, then they have visions of wires sticking out of their head and, and worse. When, you get, when the demons get through playing with you, and be, Satan picks up his option on you. And then you realize what you've got yourself into so easily, you may never get out of. And so if Jesus had said yes, he would have gained those kingdoms, I'm sure, and been the mightiest emperor of all time. And everything that any king had ever had, he would have had until Satan got sick of it and started to pick up his option on him. Then he began, like Herod, to have nightmares and other things, screaming out and jealousy and killing the children and everything else. But he said, 
it is written. And therefore, he can give us prisoners chained to a barbed wire fence. He can give us a cup of cold water. Now, because Caleb, who's a type of the overcomer, coming to the Joshua, whose name really is Jesus in the Hebrew, Yeshua, had come, similar to Yeshua, had come, and Caleb had overcome, therefore, he was able to give to his daughter and son-in-law water. But if he had not overcome, he, he would have been no, no position to do this. If he just said with the rest, well, I'll take whatever they give me. But he went and he said, this is what I want. And Joshua said, go get it. Okay, you're, you're free. On, go on. If you overcome, you can have that thing. And that's what Jesus is saying to us. But look how it manifests itself. In a blessing upon his seed. And the promise to you is that if you will overcome, in the diff if you will stake out what you want in God and say, Lord, you know, I want to do your will. I want to be an overcomer. I want, I want to meet your expectations. And you'll do that to the death of your soul. The day will come when you will be able to give water to your seed. Now, whether that means spiritual seed or physical seed or both, I don't know. But I do know it's a biblical concept that the overcomers will be on the throne and it will be their people who will govern the earth. The overcomers, the place of the overcomer is on the throne. Very few people it seems in history have been overcomers at the depth that God is requiring today. That's why he said many that are last shall be first. And God is requiring a very, very deep personal commitment to us, drawing us out many times till it seems like we're going to crack. But all that is to bring us to that place where we can give water, where we can minister, and nourish, and that our seed shall be blessed in the earth. That's part of it. You have to have a heart like Caleb. It's, it's, Caleb says, I'm 85, I'm strong. Some people are 85, and they say, well, you know, I'm weak, I'm 85, I must be dying. I, I think a lot of this stuff is an attitude of mind. Maybe I'm wrong on that, and I'm sure it's not always true, but in many cases, I think people give up before they're beat. They quit before they're defeated. And if you have, if you can say it, just say before God, I'm a strong, I'm strong, the strongest I've ever been in my whole life, Lord. Are you over the hill? It's interesting, the psychology of people. I heard a minister one time say, uh, oh, with our agent, he must have been Easy, 45. I mean, he was ancient. I mean, this man was tottering on the edge. And he said, well, the revival isn't for us old people. It's for the young people. You know what the young people say? The revival isn't for us. It's for the older people. We're st still trying to enjoy the world. You know, the net of that is nobody serves God. The young are too young. The rest are too old. And there's nobody in the middle. So you have to take a hold of yourself, whether you're 13 or 85, and you say, I'm as strong, I'm the strongest now I ever was in my life, and this is the greatest day I ever lived in the kingdom, and I am ready to go for the summit. I you just get stronger just thinking about it. Lord, what's the new challenge? Today, today, Audrey and I have been married 40 years. And I said, uh, honey, are you ready for the next 40? <laughs> so we talked about that for a while. She said, Maybe we better take it 10 years at a, <laughs> at a time. Let's get ready for the next 10 years. Praise the Lord, 40 great years, and I'm ready for 40 more.
Now, what has God got out there? 100 million Eastern Europeans. That's what I say. I don't know where that figure came into my mind. It just popped in one day. And I believe God for that. 100 million Eastern Europeans. Why not? That's just a drop in the bucket. Give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. Man, I'm a young fella compared to Caleb. <laughs> How about you? You want a mountain? What mountain do you want? 100 million. Pick a number, pick a place, pick a people. That's what Caleb did. He said, I want this mountain. Give me this mountain, Lord. Why? I don't know. God, it's just in my heart. In my heart. Not, you know, if you say no, fine, it's not for status, it'll probably mean endless problems and bewilderments and confusion. But somehow it's there. And the joy of it is there. Huh? Praise the Lord. Let's stand and worship the Lord. I believe he'll do it. I really and truly believe he'll do it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it in Jesus' name. I believe it. People must believe God. Hallelujah. Now, hold it, hold it. You do not believe. Listen, I've told you. When I was a fifth grade teacher walking around Palo Alto, I said, God, I want to speak to everybody in the world. No way under heaven. No possible way. It didn't make any sense. But I lived to see the day that I was on the platform at Morris Sorolo School speaking to representatives from all over the world. And Stan was there. And how that came from the fifth grade in Palo Alto to the platform in the El Cortez Hotel, I do not know. All I know is it happened. And God hears us. We've got a map up there. Most of it's empty, but there's a few flags on it. And I want to see the rest of that thing fill up with flags. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of you will be singing the song of China someday. That's a great big hole up there. It's not on my heart. It may be on yours. The Mediterranean area, the whole Arabian nation. Do you realize they just passed a law? They do not allow alcohol in Iran. And today they passed a, a decision that anyone caught with a small quantity of drugs is put to death. They're trying for some kind of righteousness, some kind of morality, while in their, w this country is absolutely insane in its judgments. It's insane. You don't think so. You ought to sit in court and watch. Oh, it's indescribable what drugs are doing to people in this country, and we don't have any strength to do anything about it. And here's people over there without Christ and without God knowing nothing, trying to stop drugs among their people and outlawing alcohol. I don't know how that strikes you, but I am so ashamed of this country. It seems like we have no strength to say to anybody anything. And all that's on the front page of the paper today is the problems with teenage sex. Do you realize this is insane that this should be a problem? You don't just see it? Amen. Can't you see the insanity, the thing that the nation is like a bunch of babies with jam smeared on their face? We have no sense of reality, worth, dignity, or anything. The communists have vastly more than we do. And in spite of the prison and the rottenness of the way they do, they're trying to have some semblance of government, law, and order, and morality. And we have gone crazy in this country. Amen. And God will hold us accountable for all these Arabians. Somebody's got to go there and sing the song of Jesus in Iran, Iraq, and the rest of the Arabian desert. And it might be you. South America's untouched by us. Doug and Duet are interested in Peru. Tell the Lord, give me this mountain. Yeah, I'm just going to live and retire. I doubt it. I doubt some of you. You're looking at retirement's 30 years away. I don't think there'll be any money left by the time you get there. Why don't you get your mind on economic reality, which is God? Amen. Pick out some nation. You say, well, this is nuts. What nation? Get an atlas and break it open and look at it. And you like it and put your finger down. It might be Tibet. You know what those people do up there? They prop up dead bodies and eat them to get strength out of them. 
in Tibet. And the Chinese are trying to stop this stuff because it's so obviously abominable. But the Chinese don't have the knowledge of Jesus. It's just common sense. You don't prop up dead people and eat them. But the Tibetans are very religious, and this is what they're doing. Maybe your finger, you go like that, we'll go on Tibet. You say, it's cold up there. Get clothes. Get clothes. And you know, you say, God, give me this mountain. I'm only 45. I'm only 50. I'm 25. God, give me this mountain. The worst he can do is say no. And he might say yes. And you might have yourself an inheritance. Lord God. Jesus, it must be a marvel to heaven. After the things that you said, our vision is so circumscribed. It is so narrow. It is, God, we, we don't give you the glory to your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, and we think of this old world rocking and reeling on and sin and ignorance, Lord, and they don't know up from down. And we're frightened of the communists, and we're frightened of the homosexual, and we're frightened of physical death, and we're frightened of torture, and we're frightened of all this, and the meanwhile developing a cancer. Jesus, help us to understand, Lord, what is going on in this world. Oh, Father, we would not take away your glory in this way, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we say tonight, give us this mountain, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, these places we've named tonight, Lord. The whole Saudi Arabia, the whole region, Lord, need your glory. They need the presence of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. They're just waiting for someone to come. The signs and wonders that they may worship the Lord. The Tibetans, Lord, in the darkness for centuries, waiting for someone to come up in the power of the gospel. And all through South America, and all through the rest of the world, Lord, and all the Iron Curtain countries, Lord, try striving for government and law and order, hating what they see in capitalism. Lord, God, do something and pour out the latter rain, we pray. Pour out the latter rain, Lord, and use us, Lord. We present ourselves to you, Lord, in the few years of our lives, Lord. Do something. Give us this mountain, Lord. Give us this mountain, we pray. In Jesus' name, give us this mountain, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Each person in this church, Lord, give us a mountain, Lord. Give us somebody to weep over, somebody to pray for, somebody to live for, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, God, in Jesus' name. Lord, your inheritance, Lord. Your inheritance, lies waste, Lord, while people are building personal kingdoms, Lord. Help us, Lord. Jesus, to go forth with the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. That the nations, nations may be turned to you, Lord. Hallelujah. The whole nations of Arabs, nation after nation return to you and bow the knee, Lord. He keeps silly out of Ohio. We believe it, Lord. We're in the time of the latter rain, Lord, and we pray for latter rain. We pray for signs and wonders. We pray for the raising of the dead. And we pray, Lord, for people who will do your will. Lord, and take hold of the kingdom in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.